All right. In this video, we're going to be learning about micrometers, specifically the outside diameter micrometer or outside mic or OD mic, depending on who you're talking to, what they want to call it. Some people just call them mics. Uh, but it's the most, uh, it's one of the most common gauges that you're going to use in your career as a machinist or an inspector. And they're a very accurate gauge. Um, they can get uh, as they have resolution down to one ten thousandth of an inch uh, here on the vernier scale. So uh, these are very accurate, very useful, and we're just going to focus on this one style, um, and then we're going to do another video about uh, all the other different types of styles uh, of micrometer out there, but we're going to focus on the outside mic. We're going to look at the, you know, all the features, all the pieces, what to call them, how to calibrate them, the accuracy that's involved, how to handle them, and what they can measure in terms of GD&T. So let's just jump into it. So um, first of all, let's talk about the different pieces of the mic and identify them. And uh, please forgive me if I uh, say the wrong thing, because uh, some of these things still trip, uh, trip me up every now and then. But um, as you see, uh, number one is the frame. So uh, you just this, this large piece down here that you uh, grip onto the micrometer with. Number two are the anvils. The anvils are what make contact with the part. So as you, uh, as you go to measure something, the anvils are what is touching the part. Uh, third up there, the spindle. So the spindle is what's rotating here. Um, it's the, uh, the piece that, that moves in and out. Um, other styles of micrometers have non-rotating spindle uh, anvils, and, but most OD mics are going to rotate as you twist back here. Um, number four, the sleeve. So the sleeve right here has got, um, got these etchings on them for the vernier scale. Um, it's got your uh, distance traveled uh, right here on the sleeve. Number five is the thimble. Uh, thimble, basically where you want to grip it back here on this grip. Um, many thimbles are going to have a ratchet, which is shown as number six. Some won't. Um, it depends on the style of micrometer that you're using. Um, I've got another style here that doesn't really have a ratchet um, back here. It's just a uh, it's just a friction thimble. So um, there's some different styles, uh, but if you have a ratchet, it'll go ahead and click every time you make a measurement. Um, if you don't, you might have a friction thimble back here that will help you make your measurement um, either way. Um, next up, number seven, you've got a lock here on the face. So um, when it's unlocked, you're easy, uh, freely able to move that spindle uh, in and out. And when it's locked in place, I can no longer twist this. It's, it stops the rotation of, of the uh, anvil here. On this... Uh, other micrometer I have here, this black one, um, it doesn't have um, a lock on the side here. It has a lock right here, um, this kind of a thimble lock, sleeve lock. So uh, when you pull it, um, when you rotate it one way, it's completely locked. When you rotate it the other way, I can now freely move the, uh, the spindle. So some styles of micrometers have the lock here with this... Uh, ring and other styles will have this uh, lever right here on the front. Um, just take a look at what you've got. Um, and then most micrometers are going to come with an adjustable wrench. So it could be a different styles of wrenches based on the manufacturers, but uh, you should come with, uh, with one of these here. Get that on the other camera. So um, this will help you do the calibration. And if you have a large micrometer above and one inch travel, um, you're going to get a standard. So this will help you set the calibration. This tiny little standard here. Um, this is a one inch standard. It's the same thing as a Joe block. Uh, it serves the same purpose, but it's mainly for calibrating a uh, micrometer, whereas Joe blocks can be used for many other things. Um, and so just kind of get used to the terminology. I, I almost always mix up the sleeve and the thimble. Um, 
call them one or the other. So just bear with me um, if I if I use the wrong terminology today. Um, one of the key components of these micrometers is they have a rotational vernier scale, and that makes it uh, very accurate. This uh, this style of measurement uh, vernier scale um, allows you to read down to one ten thousandth of an inch very accurately. Uh, the downside to this is for beginners, it requires a little bit of math. Um, you're going to have to learn how to read this vernier scale because it's not a direct reading that you can see instantly. You're going to have to add these numbers together in your head. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to get, the easier it's going to get. It'll be second nature. But probably for the first month you use one, um, you may struggle and you may need to get out a... Uh, piece of paper and write this down. Don't be afraid. Um, count lines. Um, I have a video on reading the vernier scale, both the linear vernier and the rotational. And it goes into, into a lot of detail on how, on how to read the vernier scale, including rotational micrometers. But to do that now would be a little bit too much time. So um, I've got this quick example up here on the, on the screen. Um, if you're going to go ahead and read what this micrometer is set for, um, you're going to have to add three pieces together. The first piece is the sleeve reading. The second piece is the thimble reading. The third piece is the vernier reading. So in this case, the sleeve reading, um, as you can see where the number one bullet is, um, it's reading 0.300 plus two lines. Every line, um, every line on that micrometer represents uh, 25 thousandths. So if you can see that 0.3 very clearly, you see two little lines after it. You can't see a third. That's why on the screen there, I have 0.3 plus 0.025 plus 0.025. That is what the sleeve is telling you. But you notice your between, uh, your between lines. That second line you can see, but you can't see the third line. So you're between 0.350 and 0.375. Somewhere in between there, you don't quite know where unless you look at the rest of the vernier scale. So the second piece on there is the thimble reading, and that's going to tell you, um, uh, it's going to get you a lot closer to where you are. So in this case, the thimble reading is 11, and what you're looking for is where that horizontal line on the sleeve intersects with one of the numbers on the thimble. So it intersects closest to the 11, right? And it's between the 11 and the 12. So that's one of the key things to remember is, have you gotten to the 11? Have you gotten to the 10? Have you gotten to the 12? Um, you're always going to pick the lower number. So um, in this case, it's between the 11 and the 12. So we're going to pick the 11 thousandths. So when you add that to your uh, measurement, you've got 350 plus 11 thousandths. You've gotten to 361. And then you're going to add the last piece. The last piece is going to be that uh, 10 thousandth increment. And you're going to rotate. Um, your caliper, not sorry, your micrometer, and you're going to rotate it so that you can see the vernier scale. And you're going to try to figure out, there's 10 lines here. Actually, um, my mistake, there's 11 lines here because there's two zeros. And you're going to look for whatever one of those 11 lines matches up with one of these numbers here on the, on the thimble. Only one of them is going to match up perfectly. And you're just going to have to rotate around and really look and decide which one lines up, and that becomes the third piece of your addition there. So that's 1,000 added to the end. When you add those three pieces together, you get 0 0.3611. So what I, re what I recommend you guys do, um, first of all, good way to practice is to practice on something you always know. So grab some Joe blocks. Uh, you can grab uh, some pin gauges, pin gauges here. If you've got a set of pin gauges, practice measuring those pin gauges and see what it looks like um, on your micrometer. Uh, but again, remember to check out that video on the vernier scale. Um, if you're looking for uh, more practice and more tips, uh, we're, we're going to move on um, to another example. Um, because what I want to point out, um, it doesn't quite show up well on the monitor, but there's a lot of confusion uh, when you're near the zero on the thimble scale. Um, I've got three pictures there 
um, where we're really close to that zero on the thimble. Let's see. Right here. So, hold on. Let me turn on the laser pointer. Oh, maybe not. All right. We'll just uh, we'll just roll with it. So we're close to the zero on on three different occasions. We're gonna. We're, how about instead we uh, we zoom that in on the uh, on the second one. So I'm going to bring this uh, micrometer. I'm going to give you three examples. Um, we're going to be near the point three. Okay, this is going to be your first example. I'm going to lock this right on the zero. Okay. And we're going to say that's right on the zero, point three. If you're having trouble seeing it on the second monitor, I am trying my best to get this to zoom in, but you can always pull up the camera feed from this one on the other video. So um, looks a lot clearer on this camera here. So one of the tricky things is what happens when you're a little bit past the zero or a little bit before the zero, and you're looking for how many lines can you see. In this case, I'm a little bit before the zero, right? And I can just barely see that next line, right? You're counting lines on the vernier scale. And one of the downsides to the micrometer is sometimes you can see a line, but you shouldn't count it. So if you can see it, but you shouldn't count it, it might be in another situation, just a little bit different. You can see it and you should count it. So how do you know the difference? What I do is I look at where the zero is and where my scale lined up. So have I gotten past the zero or have I not reached zero? In this case, this case I have right here, um, I haven't quite gotten to the zero yet. I'm between 24 and zero. So I know I haven't gotten quite to 0.3 yet, okay? Just, just a hair under. And when I move the thimble just a little bit past zero, now I'm between zero and one, and I know I've gotten past the zero, so therefore I'm at least 0.3 and maybe a half. Um, you could look at um, whichever number lines up. I would say the six tenths lines up perfectly. Six or seven tenths lines up uh, well from my point of view. So. Um, but the problem is you can just barely see that three and that line. If I really exaggerate it, yeah, I cannot see that, that line anymore. But as I move further and further away, oh, I can see it. I can see it even as far as the, as the 24, I can start to see it. So you don't want to count that line on accident. And that's one of the trickier parts of, of using a micrometer. So. Um, remember, just use some common sense, do some sanity checks. Um, if you're not sure, grab your, grab your digital caliper and double check what you're doing. You're definitely going to see if you're off by 25 thousandths if you use a caliper. So um, don't be afraid to, to use that caliper to give yourself a sanity check as you are getting more and more comfortable uh, using a micrometer and reading the vernier scale. So let's switch back to the uh, to the presentation. Get back to where we were. Um, now, when it comes to to, to calibrating, um, first thing you're going to want to do is clean it. And there's a few different ways you can clean it. Um, for me. Um, I, I really like to um, use my finger to wipe off any um, oil, any chips. Um, personally, I, I've never had a problem with, with chips, like cutting myself when I do this, but you do want to be careful. Um, so let's, uh, let's bring up the second camera again. So I'm going to, you know, wipe off this end 
uh, with my finger and wipe off the other end with my finger and just kind of grab any chips or oil. Now these anvils, when they're brand new, are very sharp. So I have once or twice, you know, given myself a nice little paper cut on a sharp anvil, uh, but never on a chip. Uh, funny enough. Um, so that's a good way to do it. Um, another way that I that a lot of people do, I recommend you give it a try. Sometimes, um, if you're if you're having trouble cleaning it off, you can grab a piece of paper. Any clean piece of paper will work, and you're just going to clamp on it uh, with the spindle, and then you're just going to drag once it's clamped. And when you drag that paper through, it's going to remove any of the any of the uh, chips and dust and coolant that was on the anvil is going to get stuck in the paper, and that's a great way to clean it. So um, that's another great way. Once you've uh, once you've done that. Check the rest of it. Check the rest of it's clean. Um, you don't necessarily, you know, want to start calibrating it while it's still dirty. Um, if you want to disassemble it, if you feel like there's a problem, all you got to keep doing is twist this off. Um, it can sometimes be a little tricky to get back on, so I'm not going to. But uh, this is pretty much what it looks like when you twist off the end. Um, this is a this is a spindle without a micrometer for it, but it's a very nice very nice uh, spindle so um, this is you could just keep threading it off and until it slides all the way off your micrometer so um, once it's clean um, let's back to our steps oh man um, don't know why it keeps doing that all right so now you're gonna check the zero reading so um, Basically, you're going to close the anvil, um, and you're going to check that it reads zero. Then you're going to grab something um, like a Joe block, and you're going to make sure that it reads whatever the Joe block says. Um, you're going to do that when it's all the way closed, right? When, you're, when, you're, when your anvils are all the way shut. You're going to do it again. Maybe about halfway through is a good point. Um, or you could do a couple of points in the middle. And then you're going to do one more at the extreme. So uh, let's demonstrate that. So first of all, let's let's check it when it's zero. And I actually haven't done that before the video. So we're going to see if this one's in, still in tolerance. So I'm just going to very gently close it. If you're using a ratchet, um, the manufacturer is going to tell you how many clicks um, you should do. Um, I believe Mitsutoyo says five. Uh, personally, I've always been uh, more uh, comfortable with three or four. Um, and it comes down to the, the fact that you need to develop a feel with a micrometer. If you're not using a, a ratchet, you still need to develop the feel. So I could do the same thing uh, without the ratchet and, and develop that pressure that I've developed over a long time of using a micrometer. I know how much pressure there should be and uh, when it's closed. But if I keep turning it, I can certainly push that uh, spindle uh, even farther and, and get a false reading. So um, something you should, should practice with, uh, again, Joe blocks, uh, gauge pins, great things to practice your pressure with. So um, let's take a look at this one's at zero. I'm going to use the ratchet since we have one. There's about three clicks, and from the camera, it looks a little bit off, and from my eye, it looks a little bit off. So um, let me uh, let me fix that for you before I check the other ones. And to do that, I think it's going to be easier for me to show you some pictures. So. Um, if you need to calibrate um, on this, on every caliper, depending on the style, there's going to be a hole back here for you to put um, your wrench. Uh, there you go. So your calipers are going to come with a wrench. Uh, looks like this here, and you can uh, use it to. Uh, basically, you're going to take the sleeve and you're going to physically move that sleeve. 
Um, so um, what I recommend, everybody's got a little different way of doing it, um, is close it where you think it's zero and take a look either on the vernier scale or, um, or, or you can even just eyeball it. Um, and you're going to have to move the sleeve that amount. So as you can see in the, in the pictures here, uh, first up, you know, there's a little bit of a difference between zero. It's not quite lined up. Uh, then the next picture, I identified where the hole is. The bottom left picture, we're putting the wrench in, and then we're going to pull. Okay, we're going to pull in the direction that we want the sleeve to move. So I'm going to try to demonstrate that. It may not show up well in video, but uh, we'll give it a shot. So first thing, um, yeah, I would say two tenths based on my eyeball. I think the two tenths lines up fairly well. Uh, let me take a look. Yeah, I would say about two tenths. So I'm going to try to move this thing two tenths, but um, i got to figure out which direction I want to go. I want that zero to move downward relative to the, uh, to the thimble. Okay. We don't want the, the sleeve to go the other direction. We want the sleeve to move uh, towards me, if, uh, if you're thinking about it that way. So um, one thing I, I don't recommend, you do it with it closed. Uh, there's going to be a lot of force involved, and you might bump it while it's closed and damage the, the spindle anvil. So I would say open it uh, one full turn and then try to eyeball it back to where you had it. Or, or use the vernier scale to line it back up. But this is going to be kind of an iterative process. Um, we're going to grab that wrench, lock it in the hole, and then um, I'm going to need to push this wrench towards me. So let me do that. Um, I'm going to, oops. I'm going to stable my hands on the, on the rock here. And you know, it, it just becomes down to apply a little bit of force. Haven't moved it yet. All right, it moved. Uh, probably can't see it move in the video, but we're gonna we're gonna check how far it moved by closing. Oh, it moved a lot. I don't know if you can see that. It moved almost pretty much a full thousand. So, as I said, it can be tricky. It can be iterative. I'm now down to the 24. So I'm gonna put it back. And I'm even going to lock it so it can't move. And now I need to go the other direction. I moved it too far one way. Now I've got to move it back. So now I'm rotating the opposite direction. Hopefully, you know, if you can't see it on the monitor there, check out this secondary camera feed. All right. I moved a little bit. I want to try to move it a tiny fraction more. Okay. Move it a tiny fraction more. This is what it looks like before I close it, but it may not be this. It may not be exactly. So let's close it. All right, I'm still still a little bit um, out of out of calibration. All right, it's not quite lined up with zero. So we're going to keep going. Unfortunately, this is like chasing your tail sometimes, but. Um, the more you do it, the more you kind of get a feel for how much pressure it takes to move this thing. Um, you can apply a lot more force towards the end of this wrench, and you'll get a little bit more control than if you try to push near the root of the wrench. So let's... All right, I got a little bit more movement. That might be good. Let's double check it. All right. It's not perfect. I could be here all day. I mean, not all day, but um, we're going to move on. We're going to say, man, it's pretty close. It's, uh, it's not that far off. Um, it's probably not as good as I would like it to be, but um, uh, we're, gonna, we're just going to move on and, and, and check that it's, um, check on that it's, that it's good. But as you can see, it's not easy. Um, well, it's not, it's not difficult, but getting it back to your perfect zero can be a little tricky. So next up, I'm going to grab a half inch Joe block and we're going to measure a half inch and just make sure that, um, 
it's reading correctly. Now, I haven't gone over how to hold a micrometer yet because this is kind of our first reading, really. Um, a great way to hold a small micrometer is to wrap it with your pinky so that you have full flexibility uh, with this hand to turn it and you can use your other hand to hold the part, whatever you're measuring. So I'm going to do that and I'm, I'm not using the ratchet. I can't quite reach the ratchet with the way I'm holding it now. So I'm using my touch and reading right about zero, um, which means we're reading right about 500, which is what we wanted. Didn't quite get to zero, but also didn't quite get to 0.5 either. So I think we're okay. Um, and then we're going to do one inch. I'm going to do a full travel check. So grab the one inch block. I know this is one inch. And same thing, I'm holding with my pinky and I'm using my touch. And what's that read? Ah, it reads a little bit over, just a fraction over, maybe two tenths or three tenths. So um, it's a little worrying, right? I, I did three different measurements and I got one. Um, let's see, I don't remember my zero. Let's do our zero again. little bit above zero, right? And then um, at 500, I got pretty much 500. Um, 500 thousandths. So um, there's a little bit of play in this micrometer, probably more than we would like. Um, looks pretty good, maybe a hair over. Um, so overall, I say it's it's in pretty good condition. It's not in the best condition, but it's also not a new micrometer. This has seen some use. It's not unexpected. Um, it's probably just on the edge of tolerance in terms of repeatability. Uh, but I would say uh, it's probably good enough to use. But um, I say probably just because uh, trying to do this on video, and yeah, we're not measuring any real parts. But uh, you know, check uh, check your manufacturer specs. Check your calibration uh, requirements, see what kind of accuracy you need out of the calibration. It's never going to be perfect, uh, dead on perfect, but um, just need to be close. I would say with your, if you're within one ten thousand when you're doing your zero and you're checking all your points, you're, 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 good, you're good to go with that micrometer. All right, so let's jump back to our presentation. All right. So we skipped ahead. Um, let's see if we did all of our steps. Um, oh yeah, so what happens if you get a really drastic difference? Um, you know, I got some very small differences in those three readings. But if you get a big difference, the, you've, got a, you've got a problem. Um, the frame is most likely bent. These things can bend, especially as they get bigger and bigger. Um, they can get up to 20 inches, 24 inches. They can get really big. I've heard stories of 70-inch uh, micrometers, uh, two or three people needing to handle them uh, to get one measurement. So uh, these, these frames here can bend um, if you apply too much force one day. The spindles can also get damaged. So um, you want to be careful to, to inspect these, make sure that they are flat. There's no chips in the spindle that might be throwing off your reading. Um, and overall, just look for any damage at all that, that may be affecting your micrometer accuracy. Um, unfortunately, if, uh, if you've got a problem, you know, like damage, replacing that one part, yeah, it might be cost effective, but it might not be. Uh, it may actually be more cost effective to replace the whole thing. Uh, getting replacement parts is almost the cost of a new one in many cases. So um, just treat them gently, treat them carefully. A small one inch micrometer might run near between 70 and $100 and they'll get more expensive um, as they get bigger. Uh, but typically from zero to three inches, zero to six inches, they're pretty reasonable because they're pretty commonly available. So um, just try to remember that as you uh, 
try to keep them in good condition so you don't have to replace them often. Ah, one more thing I uh, forgot to mention. Um, I use the Joe block to check calibration, um, but every, uh, every, every mic above an inch in size, like this one, um, is going to have the uh, calibration block that comes in the case. And you can use this to set calibration on anything that's above uh, zero to one mic. Because obviously I can't, I can't zero this out. So let me show you how that works. Um, since I can't, uh, I can't physically close this micrometer, right? This, this, always, this gap's always going to be here. Manufacturers provide a one inch distance for you to use. So when you're doing that, you treat it just like it's a Joe block. And then as you're closing it, um, if it spins like this and it's not wobbling and it's actually even like, you know, staying in there with the little bit of pressure you applied, uh, you check your zero. Looks pretty good to me. I wouldn't even change it. Um, so, um, but that's the key. If, 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 uh, if you've got a, you know, sometimes these get very long. If you have five to six micrometer, you're going to have a five inch standard. If you have a 12 inch micrometer, you're going to have a 12 inch standard. So if, when you're using one of those bigger ones, if it's wobbling around a lot, um, you just haven't tightened it down enough. So look for it to spin smoothly like this. It may not spin exactly on center because you're not going to be able to hold it exactly on center, but as, as it spins around and it feels smooth, um, you check your zero. So that's why the micrometers come with one of these, so that you can check and set your zero. Um, you can use the same wrench. You know, it's the same procedure, no matter how big your micrometer is. All right, let's, uh, let's uh, continue. All right, so we've gone through checking um, at zero, checking halfway through, checking at one inch. Um, we've gone through an adjustment. Um, and now we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk about how accurate micrometers are. So your typical bi-directional uh, accuracy is going to be uh, one ten thousandth of an inch. Uh, that'll be true for most micrometers that are less than, say, three inches. Uh, but you'll want to verify with the manufacturer of the micrometer to be sure. Um, when they get above three inches, they also tend to get a little bit more accuracy error. So it'll grow as the micrometer size grows. Um, I'd say, you know, uh, one thousand, uh, one ten thousandth and fifty millionths uh, when you get above three inches to six inches maybe two ten thousandths above six inches and three ten thousandths above 12 inches. Uh, it follows that um, general trend. Um, and accuracy error is going to be kind of dependent on how big everything gets. You know, it's length dependent. Um, so bigger thing you're measuring, more error you're going to have. It's the same as with the caliper, it's the same with the CMM, same with every tool. Um, more the uh, more you have to travel, the more error you get. So then um, the next question is, well, you know, when can you use this? When can you not use this? And, you know, my tolerance threshold to use a micrometer is about 1,000 of tolerance zone. So that's actually a very small tolerance zone if you only had 1,000. If you had larger than 1,000, you could still use a micrometer. Um, if you had less than 1,000, um, that's debatable. So there's not there's not very many gauges that are more accurate than this. So uh, you may still need to use a micrometer because an indicator it's not going to give you that much better accuracy. Uh, a CMM might and it might not. It all depends on on the on the part and the feature. Uh, so, um, but in comparison to a caliper, uh, if you've seen the caliper video, I, I said that you want to use a, a ten thousand before it, so that you use a caliper. That's the minimum. And with a micrometer, it's only 1,000. And if you see this graphic here, um, basically on the bottom bar that goes from red to yellow to green back to red, um, 
each one of those squares is uh, one ten thousandth of an inch. So you want your measurement to fall, you know, in the middle of that zone, and then you do your plus or minus. Uh, in this case, I put uh, two uh, two ten thousandths. So uh, as you get closer to one of the edges, left or right, close to those warning signs, again, it's just like a caliper. Uh, you might be out of tolerance. Uh, but because you're talking about a ten thousandth of an inch, it's usually not an issue. You're either in tolerance or you're not in tolerance. Um, every once in a while, when you, you know, start talking about manufacturing things um, with one thousandth of tolerance zone, so you're going to get a lot of parts right on the edge. You know, and you're going to have to make sure your, your, your micrometer is calibrated. Because your micrometer might tell you yeah, you're, you're one ten thousandth within spec or you're one ten thousandth out of spec. And that's a very, very small increment to accept or reject something. So um, that's one of the challenges of precision manufacturing is sometimes it comes down to the accuracy of your gauge, the accuracy of your machine, the environment you're in, um, all of that working together. So um, we've talked about some handling already. I've mentioned, you know, the smaller mics. Um, you can kind of grab it with, with your fingers um, in, the amp, in the frame here. Um, another tip, I rec you know, I've seen some people, um, they'll, they'll kind of roll it on their arm to quickly, um, you know, move the uh, spindle. And that's okay. That's a great way. You know, that's, that can be a good way to close it, but you can... If you're not paying attention and you really uh, drive this thing home, um, sooner or later you're going to damage something in, on the internal. So be careful when you're doing that, but um, you'll, you, you might see some people doing it. Um, when you are going to put these things back in the case, especially a zero to one micrometer, um, what you don't want to do, switch the video. Uh, what you don't want to do is put these back in the case when the anvils are closed. So there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one of the reasons is going to be if it's closed, um, sometimes it, due to the temperature variations, the heat variations, this thing will start to expand. And when the anvils are closed, they have nowhere to go and the pressure builds up um, and you could damage some internals in the backside. That's one of the reasons. Uh, vibration, you know, just from carrying this thing around in a case in a car, it's the same issue. There's, there's, there's nowhere for this thing to go if there's a bad vibration. So um, what you'll want to do, I would say, leave about, you know, one rotation or even 0.1 uh, of an inch and then lock it in place so that it can't rotate on you in the case and, and set it in the case. Um, sort of skipped over some of the other reasons. Um, if these, uh, if these anvils are, are closed and touching, sometimes rust can develop between them uh, because they're touching and there might be just the slightest, slightest air gap and there might be just the slightest bit of moisture in the air and you'll get some rust accumulation there. So um, that's another good reason. But I would say uh, leave a, about a you know, uh, 0.1 gap is, is, a good, uh, is a good way to still fit in the case and leave a nice gap so that you don't have any issues. Um, and remember to lock it down and don't leave them closed. Um, you know, and some other, uh, some other tips, just like with a caliper, if you've watched that video or any of these other videos, um, the, the amount of pressure you apply is important. So um, as I measure, um, as I measure this diameter here, um, see if I can do this on the camera real good. If I apply kind of a weak pressure, uh, that's kind of a weak pressure. I'm at a 0.750, and let's say it's three or four tenths. Um, again, we're kind of uh, we're in that danger zone of am I past the zero or am I before the zero? Well, I know I'm between zero and one, so I'm past the zero. I'm seeing two lines, so I'm at 750, um, and then I'm gonna got kind of a you know you can see it's it definitely stopped, but it is wiggling through. I could apply more pressure, and now I'm at 750. And I could apply even more pressure, and now I'm at 749 and about 8 tenths. Let's see if you can see that. 
749 and about 810. So just on the variation in pressure, um, you can apply a few tenths of uh, extra pressure and, and get a bad reading. So uh, you want to develop that pressure. You want to use the ratchet. Um, if you have a friction thimble, it's similar to a ratchet, but it won't make a noise. And your thimble is just going to spin as soon as it meets a resistance uh, from your part. So the ratchets are a great way to get even consistent pressure that doesn't involve person to person, whether you're tired or whether you're holding at a weird angle. You know, the ratchet is always going to go at the same pressure. Um, a lot of people don't trust the ratchets, and, and I understand. Um, I, my, um, my philosophy is to always just know what you're doing, know what it's capable of, and make the decision yourself whether you're going to use this ratchet or whether you're going to go by touch. Um, a lot of machinists who've been doing this a long time, inspectors, they prefer to go by touch because they've got that experience and they don't have necessarily experience with the ratchets. Especially a new ratchet, a new micrometer you've never used is going to have a different feel. Um, so I understand that too. And I just want you guys to know what your options are. Um, don't blindly trust your ratchet. Don't blindly trust your feel. You know, be, be paying attention um, and observant of what's going on. So let's jump back. Um, and remember, you know, it's not a huge, it's not a huge uh, consideration, but the more you handle this thing, the more you're going to warm up this micrometer. And it's made out of very temperature stable materials, but every material expands with temperature uh, rising, contracts with temperature falling. So um, in some very, very precise um, measurements that have very small tolerances, um, I've been handling this for about half an hour now, so we, you know, we want to be careful about how long we're handling it and if we're maybe changing the temperature, even where we're touching it, whether we're touching it on the frame, we're touching it here on the spindle, which is metal, this frame is going to be a little bit more temperature stable, so um, try to handle it there as best, as best you can. And then when you set it back down on the cool granite surface, it's going to be changing temperature again, the heat is going to be moving into the granite. so. Um, not a big consideration. I haven't really run across it in my career. Some people I've talked to have. Um, so just be aware of it. Try to, uh, try to minimize it when you are dealing with a very, very tight tolerance. Um, now, I've already talked about developing a feel. But when it comes to these big mics, if you're ever working with a really large mic, um, man, that can be difficult. Um, I've had to do that a lot. And um, you want to, one of the trickiest things is, are you registering correctly when you've got a big diameter and you've got these tiny spindles? These spindles are the same size as this micrometer. They don't get, you know, they don't get any bigger. So um, I have, a, I have a, a couple of suggestions, whether it's big or small, um, when you're, uh, when you're trying to, uh, decide if your if your spindles are registered. You kind of want to rock that part into place. So, um, actually, here we go. We're going to demonstrate this. Can't demonstrate it with a huge mic, but uh, we can do it with this one to two mic. So, first of all, if I'm trying to make take this measurement uh, right now, I'm I'm too small. The part definitely won't go in there. So we're going to open this up, and and then. Okay, now it can definitely go through, and now we're going to kind of close it up, and then as I'm closing it, open a little bit more, as I'm closing it, I'm going to pivot the part back and forth this way, I'm going to slide it in and out this way, because I need to register both in this direction and this direction to get a good reading, and, and when you have very large parts, sometimes people tend to be at a different plane. Um, this is kind of an exaggerated example, but they'll be at a different plane, and because they can't see everything, their ratchet is stopping, and they're just at a weird angle. So um, it helps to twist either the micrometer up and down, or the part up and down, and slide it in and out, and slowly move in the part. 
All right, so we're getting closer, and I'm not even really looking. I'm kind of just feeling it. Okay, I've got a good feel. I can't twist it anymore. It's definitely registered that way, and I'm trying to rock it through. I'm gonna I'm gonna open it up a tiny hit, tiny bit, and there we go. When it kind of slides through, you're gonna get that nice, like almost a suction cup finish. You know, as it slides through, just perfectly. Um, we'll lock it down and we'll read it at uh, 1.225 plus 6,000, so 1.231. Um, let's see if I... Uh, no no shame in, in, in double checking with a caliper. So caliper gave me 1.230. Um, micrometer gave me 1.231. I'm going to trust the micrometer because it's a more accurate measurement uh, device. So but I know I'm in the ballpark. I didn't add it wrong. So, um, so when you're working, when you when you're up with a large part, you know, if imagine uh, this micrometer I'm holding all the way out here. Um, you're gonna want to um, rotate it horizontally and twist it this way, right? And go in and out. And, and then you know, when, as you get closer and closer and closer, it's gonna be harder to move it. You're gonna be able to. To, to slide it back and forth. Uh, once you've got the twist out, it'll be easier to just slide it back and forth and get your final reading. All right. So that's basically um, the same procedure I just showed you, um, whether it's big or small. Uh, try to practice that with some round parts and some uh, you know, gauge pins is my go-to. Keep practicing on things you know. Um, and then cleaning. We've, we've talked about cleaning already. Um, it is okay to rub these a little bit with a solvent, a very light solvent, but you don't want to soak it or blast it with compressed air. You don't want to, you know, dunk it in anything. But if you need to clean off some sticky coolant, some sticking oil, um, it's okay to use a light, light solvent. Um, every once in a while, uh, you may need to disassemble it and put a drop or two of um, put a drop or two of lubricant on the uh, on the screw here. Show you that. So as you take this apart, if you keep if you keep unscrewing. There we go. We're gonna expose this ball screw. It's very uh, accurate, uh, very accurate ball screw. Um, you can see it down there. There it is. Um, so you can put a couple drops of lubricant, um, you know, a special spindle lubricant, um, and uh, that'll help you get a nice uh, smooth motion. Uh, here, if it feels like it's sticking, you know, you can take it apart. Make sure you're using lint-free um, cloths, uh, you know, rag or not rags, but wipes. Um, just make sure you're not leaving anything behind. Um, and just one or two drops usually is enough. You don't need to put a lot. Um, definitely don't. If it's easier to, to add an extra drop than it is to take one off. So. Uh, Last thing we're going to talk about um, in terms of micrometers is what GD&T can this do? Um, so first of all, you can do a circularity, um, which I will demonstrate. Um, I will demonstrate that now. So it's just like with a caliper. Uh, when you want to know how circular something was, you just uh, go around at the same plane. There we go. So I'm reading, what am I reading? Uh, I'm reading 0.516, and we will say that's 8 tenths, so 0.5168. That's one of my readings. Um, and then we're going to rotate the part, and we're going to check another location, and we're going to say 0.518. We'll call that 2. So I've got about 4, 4 ten thousandths of uh, error already uh, just going around. And now I'm at 
we'll call that six. Uh, so as you, as you just go around at the same plane on a circle, you can get the circularity error. Circularity error is going to be the difference between your smallest reading and your biggest reading. Uh, so take those uh, high numbers and those low numbers, do a subtraction, that's your circularity error. The other thing you can do is you can do parallelism. Here we go. So with a, uh, uh, with a uh, parallel surfaces, um, you can check well, how parallel are, are, is this face to this face, right? If you check the print, I don't believe there's a parallelism callout, so it's just going to fall into a plus or minus uh, 5,000 uh, thickness call out, but that means you should be parallel within 10. And let's see what we've got. Um, right now, I've got uh, about one inch, just a bit less than 2,000, say one inch, one thousandth and eight tenths. And then over at this corner, let's see what that is. Ooh, one inch and about five tenths. That's a big difference that's already happened. That's about one thousandth and uh, three tenths. Um, so let's check this corner. Again, I'm doing this by feel. Ooh, this is down to 0.997, no, 0.998 and two tenths. Um, so there's, there's a big parallelism error. Well, relatively big. That might be perfectly fine for this part. Uh, but I'll take the, the, the biggest number I saw, which was above an inch, and the smallest number I saw, which was below an inch, and we will get our parallelism error. So it's not the best way to do parallelism by, by far. Um, you know, an indicator and a surface plate is going to do a much quicker, faster, easier way. But sometimes when you have your part in the machine, you can't... Um, you can't take it out and do a parallelism check. So this can be a good way to, I saw there was a problem right away. Um, and then the caliper would do the same thing. You can see a problem right away. Um, if it's a tight tolerance call out, this one doesn't have a tight tolerance call out. So uh, we're gonna say it isn't a problem uh, for this part. But that's a, a couple of things, a couple of GDNT features you can check uh, with just a micrometer, no other tools. So in summary, um, I just want to stress, it is an extremely accurate tool. It might be the most accurate one you're going to work with um, because, you know, like I said, a $70, $100 micrometer can get you uh, one ten thousandth of resolution. And other gauges that do that are going to be just as expensive or even more expensive. So um, you're going to be using these a lot. Any, any parts that you're turning with a lathe, this is going to be a, a go-to uh, measurement tool for anything that's a tight tolerance outside diameter. The downside, you know, compared to our calipers, um, this OD micrometer can only measure something on the outside. It has no other measurement functions to do internal features, um, distances, nothing like that. So um, you're really limited to just outside features, uh, but that's okay. Um, you just might have to buy more of them because the range typically only an inch at the most um, no matter what style of micrometer you're looking at um, uh, you can calibrate them in-house uh, with calibrated job blocks so that procedure where we went through and we checked zero um, and we checked halfway through and we checked the full distance well if you're using calibrated job blocks that have a traceability you can calibrate this micrometer with those. That's a you're going to want to also check for um, you're going to want to also check for uh, damage on the spindles, as well as um, close them and, and look for any light, uh, which you really shouldn't see like you do with a caliper because these are so small. But um, if you do see something, you definitely got a problem. Um, and then last thing, you know. There are digital micrometers uh, for sure, but um, they're expensive. They might be two or three times the cost, and you're really going to need to get comfortable with the Vernier scale. Like I said, it took me about a month to really get comfortable to where I didn't need to write things down, and I didn't need to like count out loud one line, two line, 25 thousandths. Um, 
but eventually I did get there and um, it's really uh, critical if you're going to be using these every day. Just, um, just practice a bunch. So, uh, Thank you for uh, watching this video and uh, I hope you enjoyed learning about uh, outside micrometers. Um, please check out my website pragmaticmetrology.com for uh, any more videos uh, related to many other gauges and um, concepts that are important in inspection and metrology. Um, and I want to thank the Laney uh, Machine Technology Program in Oakland uh, for providing these parts that I could use and a lot of these tools. Um, it's a great program. I recommend you check it out if you want to learn about manual machining, CNC machining, inspections, mechanical drives. They have many, uh, many courses. They have um, certificates you can earn that will um, be a great resume booster uh, for your job search. So uh, please check out the Laney Machine Technology Department in Oakland. And um, thank you, and I will see you in the next video.